Well, it looks like a few more folks are joining us still. Um, let's give it one more minute and we'll get started. Well, welcome to our Thursday installment of Webinar Wednesdays. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Asami Tenimoto. Um, I'm a recycled, recycling technical advisor at the Recycling Partnership, and I'm co-hosting today's webinar with Elizabeth Schussler. Um, a few housekeeping to start. Everyone has been muted, but you can unmute yourself if you need to. Um, but if you have questions along the way, if you could use the Q&A feature, there is, should be a button on the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Um, if you could use that instead of the chat feature um, to streamline the process, that would be very helpful. We may not see your question in the chat. Um, and finally, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be made available on the partnerships website 24 hours following the webinar. So uh, you may already be familiar with the Recycling Partnership, but for those of you who are new to us, we are a national nonprofit 501c3. We work across the recycling system to help Americans recycle and recycle well. So what does that mean? Um, we do this by increasing access to recycling, increasing capture of recyclables, and improving the quality of recyclables. And these bottom two, uh, increasing capture of recyclables and improving quality of recyclables are what we'll be talking about today. We have projects across the US to provide grant funding for carts and other infrastructure and education campaigns to increase participation and reduce contamination. Uh, we've been around for about five years now. And during this time, we've made positive impacts in communities across the US. Um, and we've um, definitely made some positive environmental impacts um, through their work. So I've talked mostly about communities and consumers, but I wanna acknowledge that recycling is a system. And every day we are working more and more with the other stakeholders in the recycling system. Um, we definitely believe that all stakeholders have a part in improving the system. So while a lot of the work we do, especially the work that I do is with the communities, um, we are working with other parts of the system as well. And we do our work with support from our funders who have um, signed onto our mission and believe in what we do. So uh, what is the bag deal? Um, we'll probably mention film a few times today, but Elizabeth and I will be focusing today on bags and bagged recyclables. Uh, we'll be talking about the extent of the problem, why they're problematic, why it may be happening, and what you can do to reduce this contaminant in the uh, residential curbside stream. In our 2020 um, State of Curbside Report, which uh, just came out and we hope that everyone's already downloaded and read it, um, but we estimate that American households generate about 7.3 billion pounds per year of plastic bags and film. Um, another study by More Recycling um, that they did for the American Chemical Council shows that only 147 million pounds of plastic bags and film are collected and 90% of that 147 million pounds were collected through store drop-off. So where's the other 98% going? Um, unfortunately, a lot of it is ending up in the curbside recycling stream and even in places that are not accepting them um, in their program. And our national um, capture studies 
um, are showing that you know, bagged recyclables can be up to 30% by weight of the recycling stream. So that is a significant amount. And we are seeing that bags and bagged recyclables are definitely the top one of the top contaminants in res residential recycling. So contamination right now is at the core of issues that face recycling today. The national average inbound contamination rate, uh, so that's what's collected curbside and delivered to a material recovery facility or MRF, is about 16.9%. Um, this also came from our 2020 state of curbside report. Some communities are doing very well, um, keeping this number below 10%. Some are seen as high as 50% contamination. Um, the Recycling Partnership estimates that contamination costs the U.S. recycling system at least $300 million every year. And that's a significant amount. Um, our MRF data shows that on average, 24% of contaminants are plastic bags or film, um, contributing significantly to the cost of contamination. And like I said before, across the US, we are seeing over and over again that plastic bags and bagged materials are top issues. So why is this a problem? Um, plastic bags are problematic because they wrap around the sorting equipment like the one shown on the slide. Um, it prevents the equipment from sorting materials properly. So, you know, with all that clogging happening, the containers aren't going through the, um, and the, the paper is getting all clogged up in there too. So the, the materials that you want to get uh, sorted properly is not getting sorted. Um, in reaction to that, MRFs may need to hire more staff to pull out these contaminants before they get to that equipment and slow down the line so that these um, laborers can pull out the materials before it gets to the machinery. Um, and to remove the plastic bags that are wrapped around the equipment, um, operators need to shut down the sorting line multiple times a day to cut off the bags, and workers need to physically climb into the equipment to perform this maintenance work, which really puts them at a risk for injury. And overall, all that bags that come out, all the bags that end up at the MRF, um, become added waste that the MRFs have to pay for to dispose in a landfill. So these additional costs and loss of income incurred by the processor are passed down to the hauler, the community, then to the residents, which can really impact a community's ability to provide recycling service. Um, and, oh, I, I got a question in about the 30% by weight of contamination for bagged recyclables number. Um, that is the number, the, the weight of bagged recyclables that add the actual material in the bags and the bags themselves. So it's not just the bags. Um, I wanted to address that before I went further. So I hope by now you understand the negative impact of plastic bags in the curbside recycling stream. But what is the issue with bagged recyclables? Um, many MRFs don't have an efficient and safe way to remove recyclables from bags. So they choose to pull bagged recyclables out of the stream entirely to be landfilled. So this means that good recyclables that are bagged don't even have the chance to be sorted. Um, the value of unbagging recyclables can be calculated using a method called blended value. And it's basically an average value of a recycling stream. So you figure out the composition of the recycling stream and imply the index price of each material type and then get this average. So this isn't meant to reflect the actual income that the MRF is generating off the recyclables, but it gives you a dollar to dollar comparison of the positive impact that unbagging recycles recyclables can have. The chart on the left side um, shows you uh, before in intervention, this mid-sized city in Ohio had approximately 9% by weight of bagged recyclables in their stream. 
And after educating the residents to not bag the recyclables through mailers and cart tags, they found almost no bagged recyclables. So that value went down to 0.08%. And this raised their blended value by $23 per ton. So it gives you a sort of return on investment value for the education campaign. So this is a good way to um, show the impact of unbagging materials. Unbagging, oh, I. Uh, So uh, you want to first um, identify your top issue contaminant um, before you invest in an camp uh, education campaign. And you know that may very well be bags and bagged recyclables for you as well. But often um, you might start with uh, a waste sort um, and, a, and a sort of your recycling stream. But weight-based sorts are common. Um, but sometimes plastic bags may not show up as a top issue item when you are quantifying by weight because plastic bags are light. And we've spoken to a lot of communities who could not quanti quantitatively show the impact of their education campaign around plastic bags because of this emphasis on weight-based measurements. So even though we're still doing a lot of weight-based capture studies, um, there are communities that are trying to do volume-based or current-based measurements to show a more clear impact. So here's a, a result from a Chicago pilot where you can see more clearly that plastic bags and film was a top issue for them when they looked at the, the occurrence. So inspectors found that eight out of 10 carts in Chicago had plastic bags and film in them. But if they only looked at the, the weight-based data, which is the, the chart on the bottom, you can't see that they are probably one of the top items that they should be focusing their education on. And they may have overlooked that, um, that issue had they only uh, relied on the weight-based data. Uh, here's another example of a community tracking occurrence. Um, as part of our partnership with the Ohio EPA, we worked with the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio, or SWACO. Uh, during their first pass of cart inspections in Columbus, Ohio, uh, plastic bags and bagged recyclables were two of the most frequently observed contaminants. Um, these contaminants were noted on the cart tags, which were left on the carts to inform the, the residents. And you can see that um, combined, you know, trash, changlers, bulky waste, uh, yard waste, and flammables, they, they d don't even come close to being at the top of the list. So plastic bags and bagged recyclables were definitely where they wanted to focus. And they also did some specific message around not bagging. Um, you can see on the very left hand side, that was a, um, a mailer that they sent out. And they saw that uh, bagged recyclables and plastic bags uh, had the highest percent of reduction by the fourth time they went to the residence. So they went to each household in their campaign four times to inspect their carts and leave a cart tag if there was contamination in the carts. And then they also sent out this uh, mailer uh, after the first week of tagging. So the number of times plastic bags or bagged recyclables were marked as contaminants went down by 35% for plastic bags and 62% for bagged recyclables. So Swaco thinks that you know, the focus mailer on the bagging uh, or not bagging uh, helped them reduce reduce bagged recyclables more than the plastic bags. And they're also thinking that maybe the households that stopped bagging their recyclables were still putting the bags into the cart. So um, less reduction was seen there. So um, next, uh, Elizabeth is gonna be talking more about residents' knowledge, um, attitude, and behaviors around plastic bags and how specific messaging can have a significant impact on resident behavior like we saw in Columbus, Ohio. But let me check real quick, we have any other questions. Um, hey, Asami, there was a question. Yeah. Um, 
there was a question about the prevalence of take back and I just pinged um, Tanya Randall. I know she's with us today with more recycling. And um, I've, we've heard some mixed, um, we've heard some mixed reports on whether or not retailers are continuing to take bags back, especially in areas that have um, enacted bag bans or um, bags for purchase. So um, we can find out some more information there. Yeah, we definitely heard that in places that do have bag bans that, you know, they've taken away the store drop off because of it. Um, we're still where we are working with retailers, which isn't a lot yet. Um, we are telling them to make sure they do have bins because it's not just about plastic bags too. You know, the, I mean, and even in places that have plastic ba uh, bag bans, plastic bags still exist. You know, those those regulations don't typically cover every type of plastic bags. Um, and then there are also other materials like, you know, the, the Amazon shipping um, envelopes um, or bread bags or dry cleaning bags, other, other bags that can be collected through that channel. So um, we're trying to get the message out um, to continue collecting. Um, and I don't know if Tanya wants to unmute herself and say anything more on store drop-off. Um. There we go, Tanya. Okay, great. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I just put in a chat as well. We definitely have seen in California a significant decrease. In some cities, we actually don't have any drop-off uh, anymore, so, um, we, it is definitely a challenge and uh, we are working really hard to help uh, keep that as well. Great. Great. Um, I think Elizabeth, you can, we can continue. Awesome. And so as you, um, as you can see with, you know, just a few of these insights and in the data, um, this is, you know, there are some national trends for sure. And then there are some local trends that um, where programs have decided to do something different with bags and that's been, or other materials. Um, I think, you know, loosely relates to anything that needs to be handled in a way other than, than curbside or in, for a household that has any service other than curbside. So that's why we're trying to understand the behaviors and the sentiment. What do people know? How do they feel about recycling? And specifically, how do they feel? What do they know? And what are they intending to do around these um, materials? And so it's, you know, it's the two issues. It's the bags, um, meaning the single use bags and the many plastic film things. Um, and then also the bagging of recyclables. And so as we started looking into this, we, we just started digging into some research, I would say a couple of months ago, and we're finding some really interesting insights. So I wanna both share with you some of what we've heard and also um, some of what we have already in place to support your messaging for your community. So we worked on, um, we had some surveys in West on the West Coast project, meaning in California, Oregon, and Washington, and um, diverse populations. And also, some areas have bag bans and some don't. And so, it was a really interesting um, place to for us to listen. So, one of the things that we found in the West Coast and across the country is about 50% of people believe that the those plastic bags belong in their recycling cart um, in the Portland metro area and Seattle metro area where they've had bag bans in place for a while. Well, actually they're relatively new bans, but they've been messaging um, heavily about um, how to handle bags. And then they just have bag bans coming online. Um, more residents were aware that bags didn't um, go in the recycling cart, but we have not yet heard from Anasami, I think so, we are finding saw that we hadn't yet heard that the, it's the, the issue has gone away yet, the bags are still showing up in carts. So 
another thing we, so we did some quantitative research surveys in that regions, in, the, in those states, in that region, and then also across the country. So what you're hearing here is a little bit of the quantitative research and the qualitative research. We had some focus groups with different, um, some different demographic groups in some different areas. And basically the top line message for people who were talking about whether or not they thought that plastic bags go in recycling carts or not is it's plastic and it has arrows on it. So the residents are um, like often looking at the material type, whether it's around this issue or other types like glass, a lot of people think like, oh, it's um, glass or metal, no matter what shape or size or function it is. And, and so there are, there is, that is one trend that we're looking at how to better um, message to residents, not just about the material that's made, the, the item is made of, but also that it is fitting the size, shape, and function that are the packages and products that are acceptable and recyclable. So this concept that it's plastic, um, and it has arrows on it. That's something the Recycling Partnership is working on. So that's really, a, you know, that's um, an issue that spans across the whole, um, all stakeholders. So we're working on that. And um, you can expect to see this year that we'll hopefully make some more progress, not just having this data, but how to put this data to work. So um, when it came to bagging recyclables and why, do, you know, would people have, be willing to unbag or recycle their items loose in their cart, the general pushback was, well, I don't want to get my bin dirty. But then when we talked to them more about, would you be willing to take, you know, collect in a bag and then empty into the cart, um, most people were like, oh, that's no problem. I would just, I just need to know, just tell me what to do. And then when it came to both bagging their recyclables and also taking bags back, the the main thing that people pointed to was, well, it's just easier to put them in the cart, or it's just easier to take everything at once and, you know, put it in a bag and put it in the cart. So that convenience is definitely um, is still something that we were hearing quite a bit about. So about half of the people knew that they could take bags back to retail. And about half of the people said that they intended to, but really only a quarter said that they actually did. And then once you get beyond, um, you know, once you get beyond bags or once you look at what's actually collected, um, the indications are that what, you know, the over-reporting is um, definitely an issue. And so if you've been in any of our workshops or webinars in the past year, you've probably heard about this book switch, um, which is a really nice light read about behavior and um, changing behavior. And what looks like resistance is often a lack of clarity. Um, there's, you know, there's the standard, like you people need to hear it seven times. <laughs> there's the, um, study that shows our attention span is about eight seconds. And so really what, you know, with limited budget, limited resources, we're trying to build up and accumulate that um, infrastructure for messaging so that when people, they're not just getting a sprinkle of message here and there, they're getting a consistent flow of information. So as programs change, the, um, you know, that makes it easier for that information to get out um, to residents. Um, about this, how large the sample were, they really varied. Um, and the 1600 surveyed on the West Coast, um, we and the results are kind of uh, in some places mixed with multiple surveys that are national, um, I think, total, we've probably surveyed about almost 10,000 people on some of these issues. So pretty large. <laughs> um, so if, you, if you're on this webinar, you may have been um, on our newsletter list and seen the um, promotion for this. And that along with that promotion was a link to a, what we call Lightbox. And basically, that's a library of downloadable messages. And so 
that's a screenshot of that library of messages. Um, at the Recycling Partnership, we are always growing our library of resources. So we'll, you can expect to see some more from us um, this year. But what you have in here are uh, a mix of social images, some videos, and some editable graphics, some customizable graphics. So we have vector icons, we have photos, we have a whole um, load of things for you to, um, to use for your messaging. So again, you know, back to, oh, sorry, sorry, one second, back to that idea of, of a lack of clarity. So people, we heard in the focus groups that once they, they were engaged in the conversation and we told them, you know, exactly what should be happening with bags or bagging, the large majority were willing to, or at least reporting, were willing to do the right thing. They just need, um, they just need to know. So we did see, um, another thing we did see in the surveys and the focus groups was a lot of reuse of bags and it seemed to be a little bit inconsistent across populations. So that's something we'll be digging into more this year. So if you've been, um, again, in our webinars or workshops this year and probably the past um, about two and a half years, you're familiar with our anti-contamination kit. Um, we're updating that and adding some more resources into that. And it's uh, also gathering results from more programs who have taken that contamination kit and put it to work in their programs. And then, um, in that kit, it links to, uh, and you can also find it on our website in the four communities section, what we call a campaign builder. And so by answering a couple of questions about what your program takes and doesn't take, you can get to a place where you can download um, some printable pieces that have, that have been customized with your logo and your phone number and URL. I'm going to pause a second and see. I see a number of questions here. Hold on a second. Yes, so we did ask people both, did they think that they could recycle? Um, the question is, do we ask, what was sort of the question about the bags? We asked people if they thought they could put bags in their household recycling cart. And we also asked them if they thought they could take them back to retail. And we're still sort of pulling all of that data together. But as I said, you know, a half of the people said they thought they could put them in their cart and half said they knew they could take them to retail. Awesome. So one of the things when we're looking at telling people something specific that we want them to do. And it can be challenging to get to the exact um, instructions for what to do with bags or what to do with unbagging your recycling. Um, there are still programs across the country that have bags and are telling people to put their recycling in bags, but that is a minority of programs. And so um, anytime you're telling your population, you want to try to have one ask at a time change one behavior at a time. It's very confusing if we go out and try to solve for all of the issues at once. And I understand that there are limited resources. I totally get that. But um, it's, it's best if you can get to changing one behavior at a time, you'll see the most lift on that. So that one message can get to the broadest audience. If you have five things to tell people, you can get to um, sort of a middle audience and there are definitely people and they are probably your most dedicated people who want to know all of the information and just if you can make that information available online and make it searchable or make it um, something that your 311 or customer service could answer or make it something that your um, drivers can answer that's um, really helpful. So the top messaging um, we, again, we have this uh, social collection. We're growing our library around don't bag and um, 
growing our library around all of the all of the different options for what to do with these materials you want to make sure you're considering your terminology too um, one of the things we did and we haven't tested it broadly but one of the things we found in a small qualitative study was that in california the plastics these plastics were being called soft plastics um, we haven't made a change to calling them that because we haven't done a study that's large enough to confirm that that's the case. But um, I, if you're able to test your residents to better understand what they're calling things, I just noticed in looking at a Minnesota um, report that um, pop is what um, the soda is called. We don't call that, we don't call soda pop here in North Carolina. But there are definitely regional differences. And then as these newer materials come online, there will also be some, some terminology to pay attention to. What you see here on the screen is um, our updated, what we call it our annual info card, because we feel like information, like this kind of basic core information needs to go to residents at least once a year. Ideally, it also lines up with your um, messaging that you have maybe on uh, multifamily containers um, or dumpsters and then also aligns with the information that's on your website and so all of these images icons and these files are customizable for you and you can find those online So we have um, Tanya Randall, who spoke earlier a little bit of, um, on the line. And could um, Tanya, do you want to tell us a little bit about, if you're still available, you want to tell us a little bit about the store take back messaging that you guys work on? Yeah, so um, I work with the RAP program, which is the RAP, reduction, uh, action, RAP Re Recycling Action Program with the American Chemistry Council. And we have been um, working on you know, it matters where the messaging goes kind of to the point about be careful about how you emphasize recycle. Um, we have signage that says recycle here, you know, that you're going to actually put it on the bin. And then for messaging that we have um, that goes out to the general public that might be in a flyer or in, um, you know, a yearly update about recycling, it would say at participating stores. So this actual image that you're showing on the right is what we meant, what we created for like depots, so drop off locations, because they see a lot more um, different types of material that you wouldn't necessarily see at the grocery store, as well as what you wouldn't want to put in. So the idea of where you put the signage and how you're sharing the information is really important to the messaging that we convey. So um, the idea that you would put something actually on the bin that says recycle here versus telling other people to take it to participating locations um, is, is I think pretty critical in that messaging. Oh, sorry, and your program, um, the materials that you see here on the screen can help. I had a question about um, if somebody wants to take bags to set up a bag collection, the materials that are here, the messaging that's here, and also some of the program assistance is available at um, what, what site would you like to send them to, Tanya? You can go to, it's at the bottom of the poster on the right, plasticfilmrecycling.org. There is a, um, a link at the top that says contact us and you can reach out to us with a form and I see a lot of those incoming messages so we can certainly help you uh, with more questions and information and the resources for download. Excellent. And then this site, Tanya, is a little bit more about the markets in, in my Correct. Yeah, so um, this is the, the plastic film recycling. It has all sorts of information. So um, this is specifically to the wrap program and um, you know more about how we can help support local and um, local governments and, and um, organizations with outreach. And so within this, there's all sorts of information about uh, potential markets, how to contact us, resources, the communication tools and that sort of thing. But if you have questions, certainly reach out to us. We'll be happy to help. And so we had another question come in about, so where do you tell people, what do you tell people to do with these bags? 
and if the if the retail isn't um, an option, and that is exactly like that's the sixty four thousand dollar question, I guess, um, is if your you know if your program is not um, is in a bag ban location and bags aren't prominent, you might see that the retailers are curbing some of that or taking taking away some of that collection at their locations. Um, it's really just the important thing is to um, be able to verify what what the options are. There are some programs that are telling people to put them in trash for sure and that um, you know that may be the best option for your program. But understanding that you know every single thing that we're like anytime we're making a change in terminology, making a change in collection, like there's a bit of a ripple effect um, in the places where bag bans have gone into place. The, um, that means that can mean an increase in compostable bags, which is also another like complexity for, you know, collecting any of the bags and plastics. And so it, as much as you can stay in touch with what your residents want to know um, and what they what they call the things that you're talking about and what they want to do with the things that they have in their homes. Um, as best you can understand that, then you can design the messaging to um, sort of meet them where they are and direct them into the right, the right place. Sami, have I missed any questions? Let's see, there's been a couple more questions coming in. Um, have you considered using the term plastic containers instead of plastic? Did oh, I did answer, I oh, answered that, did. but didn't say send. Yes, we're, we're, we're evaluating all of the terminology and also, uh, as I said in the surveys, like the sentiment, we're testing a number of of aspects of everything that we're doing. And we're kind of doing that all the time, so. And this may be more of a Tanya question, but uh, is it safe to assume that any store that accepts plastic bags also accepts all the plastic bags, wraps, films, and envelopes on the wrap posters? Um, I would say on the whole, the answer is yes. There are a few chains, um, given they're in markets that really just want bags because they're going into a very specific end use. But on the whole, the vast majority of the stores listed in the drop-off directory on plasticfilmrecycling.org are able to take not just the grocery bags, but also the newspaper sleeves and um, case wraps and such. Great, thank you, Tanya. So we found, um, you know, I think it was um, it was a mix depending on the population. I mentioned this before, but quite a bit of reuse. People are reusing their bags as, as bin liners at home or for pet waste or for, um, you know, some people mentioned in the focus group taking their lunch back and forth to work, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, it's just, it's really, the bags are a very complex issue. So any information that your program has on what's working, what's not working, any specifics or measures or results, we would love to um, hear from you about those. Oh, I did see a message here about um, the condition of the bags going back to the retailers. Um, ideally, there are are empty and dry anything else that's going into recycling we it needs to be empty and dry and be an appropriate match for what that collection is taking um, how did we conduct our there's a question about how we conducted the research to understand the residents knowledge so we did um, a number of surveys um, we had some intercept interviews and we had a um, number of focus groups as well. Based, so we took based on what the survey results were, we wanted to know more from who said what. So we were able to kind of figure out groups of people that were saying things 
that we were more curious about, like, well, this group sounds like they might be the most willing to, you know, take things back. We want to hear more from a group composed of this um, that represents this group. And, and that was basically, that was basically our research so far. And I'm looking yeah. forward to more. Yeah, I don't think we've gotten to a point yet, quite yet, where we can see the actual improvement. Um, but we had one consultant um, can, you know, ask about their knowledge and their attitudes and behaviors. And then they kind of explained what I explained earlier about, you know, it being a problem at the MRF and, you know, it affects the, their operation and, and the, the safety of the workers. And then they, they kind of asked again some of the questions about, you know, would you change your behavior? And a lot of them said that they would. And um, just uh, knowing that you're not supposed to put plastic bags in, in the cart um, and then knowing the effect it has, um, that helped them. Yep, it's, I would think of it like a hierarchy of message, like at least tell everyone like what to do and not do. Um, and then there are, you know, like the 1550, there are a smaller group that who have questions and want to know kind of why. And then there's, you know, the much smaller group who wants to know like all of the whys. Um, and so the idea of sort of that hierarchy of messaging, making sure that everyone has the opportunity to hear as many times as they can, and ideally at, as close to the behavior as possible, what's supposed to happen in their recycling program with the material they're holding. Just reading a couple of questions here. And we have so many good questions coming in. It's hard to keep up. <laughs> Well, while Elizabeth is reading through the questions, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the reports that are on the, the slideshow right now. Um, so I, I mentioned the state of curbside recycling report um, a few times earlier in the, the presentation. Um, it is available on our website for you to download. It is a, a very comprehensive uh, information on, on data we collected nationally on how um, curbside programs are, are performing. And then we have a kind of a West Coast version, um, but a little bit different um, coming out uh, in, I wanna say two weeks. Um, and it's based off of a lot of the research that Elizabeth talked about. Um, we conducted surveys with cities, MRFs, residents, um, to understand what's going on and, and what the programs are like on the West in California, Oregon, and Washington. And then, and then we dove a little bit deeper into some of the focus groups and surveys that we did with, research, uh, with the residents. So you can expect that to come out in a couple of weeks. Elizabeth, did you have a question you wanted to answer? Um, I think that um, any, and Sami, you may know this, or Charlie is um, with us online, I think as well, any place that is accepting bags in their curbside recycling program, there have been some, and I know that there are, have been a number in California be, um, previously, I think they've changed accepting bags of bags side, but um, any specifics there, Asami or Charlie? Sorry, could you repeat that again? You broke up. Oh, sorry. Any, um, do we know of any programs that are accepting bags in their recycling program at, you know, I'm assuming that's at curbside? Yeah. And I was, there were some in California that were doing bags of bags curbside, but mm -hmm. I think they stopped that. 
Yeah, there were some, um, well, the major one that's changed recently is Seattle. They used to collect curbside and they've stopped that as of January 1st. So they've been um, trying to message that out to their residents. Um, there are a few other MRFs that they said they will uh, take bagged bags, um, but there are very few of them, just really only a handful of them across the entire West Coast. I don't know about the rest of the country. Um, but most uh, curbside programs do not accept them. Oh, we have a note that a plastic bag baler is about $14,000. Um, that's good information. Thank you for sharing that. Ah, we have a note here that 4% of MRFs from one, um, one group study says that 4% of MRFs accept plastic bags. I don't, uh, that was a survey of 367 MRFs. How many states participated in this survey? So I'm assuming this question is a question about our surveys um, that so there were there was a survey that included California, Oregon, and Washington, and then there were national surveys that where we asked um, some of the same questions. And if you guys are doing any surveys. That is definitely something I am interested in talking about. Um, so the more as an industry we can align our knowledge, the better. So connect with me if that's something on your radar. Oh yeah, I was thinking of the um, Birdsboro, Pennsylvania has been doing a pilot. Um, I think they're at a place where they're evaluating um, the next steps for um, what, what's happened there and evaluating the next steps for um, taking uh, film and bags curbside. Any other questions? Hey, Asami, this is Tanya. I just wanted to put in, because we get a lot of questions about labels on like oh, makers yes. and such. Um, and I put it in the chat or in the Q&A, but it is absolutely okay to cut those off. The end users of plastic do not need them to be like intact. They just need them to be clean and dry. So if you're struggling with say an Amazon mailer that has a sticky label, it is absolutely okay to cut that out. Thanks for that tip, Tanya. I know you get a lot of questions about labels. Yeah. <laughs> I just did that myself. I had a, I think it was an Ikea furniture with wrapping that I just could not get the, the labels off of. <laughs> yes, so that is, I, you know, at the Recycling Partnership, we know that we're going to see more and more different kinds of packaging. And if, you know, I was just reflecting on how different packaging looked even 10 years ago, the, if you looked at the big picture of the packaging mix, and I know we have a couple of MRFs online here today, um, you know, we were talking about the evolving ton a number of years ago, and I think it's still continuing to evolve. So that's why we're really keen to bring all the stakeholders together, gather as much information as we can, and, and um, make sure we're doing our best to keep as much, um, as much material in the, you know, in movement, but in out of um, end of life. So watch for more information from us. You can check out our state of curbside recycling report online that you see on the screen there that has some great information. And then 
sort of prior to that, um, we had a bridge to circularity report. So you can expect more um, information based action coming from the recycling partnership and all of you guys. Um, we so appreciate working with you and working with all the stakeholders. Uh, so I think we can, I think that seems like about the end of the questions and um, I think we can call it. We so appreciate you guys joining us today. Great. And if you have additional questions, um, you can reach us. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Well, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today and we'll give you back uh, five minutes of your day. Thanks, Asami. Thank you.